So um, having said that, we do usually want to sort of, you know, be able to go from start to finish. So the intention is that we can create a project from scratch. I'm going to show you how to add some data to your project. We'll look at some of the drawing tools, the usages, um, and then a little bit of the analytics. Um, there are plenty of other resources available to all of you or both of you um, in the in um, sort of other videos, which Greg, I know you've just mentioned you've seen on the YouTube. So if you want to dig into any particular part of the app at any time, there are a lot of resources available. Um, you can also book training sessions with us if needed as well. So I'm going to jump in. We're going to pick a quick site and um, set up some data layers on it, so some context, um, play a little bit with the lens tool, start drawing on that site, and then and play with the analytics after that. So I'm going to jump in. I'm going to start with a new blank project today in our giraffe uh, work, giraffe team workspace. Um, so as hopefully you guys will know, that should take you to a blank map in the sense that um, it won't populate it with any predefined workflows that you have set up yourself. When you start with a blank template, we give you five layers by default um, and those are there for you to manage, uh, remove or group at any time as you like. Um, and they're really just a starting point. So some really basic map controls. Um, you can uh, navigate the map in a number of different ways. Down on the bottom left-hand side in the drawing tray, there is a 2D and 3D toggle. Um, and they sort of do exactly what they say. As you uh, move between the two, it will take you in and out of a 2D or a 3D view on the map. Um, when you're in 2D, north is always up the page, so we're in a, in a sort of normal map view state. Um, you can zoom in and out as usual, and if you left click um, and drag, you will see that you can sort of pan around the map. When you're in 3D mode, and you can actually use T on your keyboard as a shortcut to toggle between that 2D and 3D state, um, you will see that you can then pan around in 3D view as well if you right click and drag. Left click will do the same as it does in 2D view, and you'll see that you can zoom out as well. Um, take the time to familiarize yourself. Once you sort of get going with some of these shortcuts and commands, you'll you'll really um, get very good at navigating the map. And it's yeah, it's really um, very easy once you've you know spent a minute or two familiarizing yourself. Um, there is also an address search on the map. We can always enter an address here. This is a global um, database that it's connected to. So if we type in here, this address, um, it will take us to, to that site. Exactly to remove the pin, you simply clear it and close um, the search window. So we've got a map, we know how to move around it now. We're just gonna spend the next few minutes looking at layers and just understanding how they work on the map. Um, as I mentioned, when you are in a, a, a scratch pad state or a blank unsaved project state, you will inherit a number of layers um, by default. Portfolio in this instance is not really helpful um, for most users who don't have many projects. If you do have a lot of projects, however, like I do in this workspace, this portfolio view will actually show you all of your projects across um, the world or you know wherever you have your saves. So I have a number of projects in this workspace um, and these outlines indicate the project boundaries. Um, this may be really helpful if you're looking to track um, a portfolio of properties or projects, but if you're not, you can simply turn it off or even remove it from the project. Um, some other things that you get by default are a satellite layer. This is a Mapbox satellite. I'm not entirely sure how often it's updated, but it is obviously a great resource to be able to see imagery on the map. Another one is 3D buildings, which you will see when you get to a certain zoom level on the map. This is a free open source data set that is authored by OpenStreetMaps. Um, it is also contributed to by individuals across the world, sort of like a Wikipedia in that sense. Um, it's really fantastic at helping you understand scale uh, and density in any location, um, but just be conscious question that this there. is an open... Question Sorry? for you there. Sorry, question sure. for you from Greg. So looking at the map view on satellite, 
Um, it's mm -hmm. great, but it doesn't seem to be very high definition. You can turn on a better map, a better aerial map like. Um, yep, we'll, we will get to some of those other resources in a, some of those other data layers in a second. But yeah, this is a free um, aerial data set. And, um, you know, you're exactly right. It isn't super high, um, you know, clarity or um, accuracy. It is, you know not fantastic so there are some other resources available you can if you do have a near map account or a metro map account by aerometrics you can bring in that imagery yourself i would just make sure that you have um, the right kind of settings and usage or data allowances with your account because every time you move around the map some of those other services will charge you to download the tiles and you'll really quickly munch through your data plan if you're not sort of appropriately set up to use it that way um we will get to those other satellite layers in a second though greg so um let give me one more second and i'll just finish talking about the other two layers here and then we'll jump into the data library um so yeah the 3d buildings fantastic resource but just be conscious that if you're making decisions about how um, you know, your site interfaces with some adjacent buildings. This is obviously not very high definition. It is an open source data set. So I wouldn't be making, you know, very, um, uh, you know, big decisions about how you interface with something based on it, but super helpful to, you know, provide context to a project. Um, and then map labels are exactly what they say. Um, they can be turned on and off depending on the kind of, um, you know, project that you're working on and potentially you know diagrams or screenshots that you may be generating um, so to your question Greg with the satellite layer um, I don't like this one either I'm actually going to remove it and we're going to add a different um, layer here so when you click on data layer it's going to pop up this interface here and this interface does lots of different things if we look at this first tab called all layers this is the wider giraffe library we connect to thousands and thousands of open source and government data layers across the world. Um, we don't uh, preview them all here. We only preview, you know, a handful that are most relevant to the location that your um, IP address is, you know, routing you towards. So if you are located in San Francisco or England or something, it's going to preview some different layers here if there are data layers available to you. Um, having said that no matter where you are you can always search with keywords so i'm going to type zoning in here and you'll see that it gives me a number of different locations which i can tell based on the naming um, i'm based here in sydney in new south wales for anyone who's joined that's not in australia um, and the government here in this state provides a lot of really fantastic um, open source or open government data layers which we bring into giraffe by default um, you can bring in any layer that is um, open source and we're going to do a really quick run through of how to bring that data in yourself in a minute if you can't find the layer in our library but if you have found something that's of interest just simply click the little tick box next to the layer name um, and it will add it to the project when you close this window. So you can go through and add, um, you know, as many different layers as you like. Um, something that's really helpful here is the cadaster or our um, parcel boundaries in New South Wales. Um, I'm also going to add some floor space ratio controls um, and a few other things. You please feel free to search for things like vegetation or, um, you know, uh, I've just gone completely blank, but any sort of, um, any sort of keyword that you think will um, show you some different results and um, you can add them to your, your map really easily. The little arrow here will show you um, any metadata that comes with that layer when it's loaded which should usually include the location that it's come from. In terms of the um, aerial that you were just talking about, Greg, we do have a number of different ones. So in New South Wales, um, we do have uh, this layer here called public in uh, New South Wales imagery. Um, you can also type in the Mapbox satellite, which is the one that we were just looking at. Um, I think there's also one called aerial no it's called something else 
uh, and it usually is previewed here, imagery in New South Wales. Those are uh, two fairly great resources, again, that are published by the New South Wales government. Um, we have a partnership with Aerometrics. So we, the giraffe team, have um, the Metro Map by Aerometrics imagery, which I'll show you as an example. Um, again, you can bring your own sort of third party imagery in if you like, you'll just need to get in contact with us to do that. So I've gone through and ticked a whole bunch of layers. I'm just going to close this window now. And when I do that, you'll see that suddenly all of them get added to the map here on the left. So now that we've got that, there's a number of things we can do. They're all just going to quickly or, you know, um, in their own time, load up on the map and we'll see them all. Um, but, you know, that's a lot of information to digest. So I can do a few things. I can manage them individually and turn them all off on their own. So all I'm doing here really simply is pulling this slider to the left or changing it to the opacity that I'm interested in. Um, and once I've done that, the map sort of back to its original state. But what I may want to do is group some of these layers. So here I'm going to click and drag one layer into and basically drop it on top of another one. The first time you do it, it may take you one or two attempts to do it, um, but don't give up. Until you drop it on top of the other one, it will then um, suggest this in this little pop up here and say, hey, would you like to give it a group name? I'm going to call these LEP controls, which here in New South Wales, that's our local environmental planning controls and save it. And you'll notice then that those two layers that I dropped on top of each other are sitting in a group together. I'm going to click and drag this one in there now as well. Um, again, it is quite easy once you've done it a few times, but the first one or two times you might find that you end up just changing the order of the layers. Make sure that you're dropping it right on top of the layer that you're interested in grouping it with. So I'm going to group these three and call them imagery. And I'll also drop in the error metrics layer as well. Once they're in a group, you can move the order around as much as you like. And you can always remove a layer from a group very easily just by dragging it outside of the group. Um, now, to your original question, Greg, about the imagery, this is the Metro Map by Aerometrics. This is quarterly imagery. Um, I'm just going to turn the 3D buildings layer off. Um, that is published by them. And you'll see as it loads, it's really fantastic high definition. So again, I would encourage you um, to you know, contact us with any subscriptions that you have to any third party data that we can help you bring in. If not, so that one, we... can you, does that have 3D images? Because I have near map subscription, um, yep. but I'm wondering if this is better or they're the same. Uh, look, um, I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. We have a great partnership with Aerometrics. Their, their imagery is fantastic. Um, it is all 2D data at the moment. But near map is great. We have a lot of customers who bring in their near map subscription. So um, if you ever want to send myself or Holly an email after this, we yep. um, we can get your API and help you get that hooked up to your account. As I say, though, just be very careful and perhaps just speak with Aerometrics about how it can be used. Uh, sorry, near map about how it can be used because as you sort of zoom around and you'll see these sort of tiles loading um, slowly depending on the type of consumption or account that you have, you will get charged per load of things. So if you're just spending sort of 20 minutes moving around and looking at it, you can end up chewing through a lot of your data allowance. So just depends on the type of account settings that you have. Um, otherwise, this public New South Wales imagery layer is actually fairly, you know, high quality, especially once you let it zoom in and, and load again. So um, there are different resources out there depending on, um, you know, your location and your, you know, type of data that you have with your organisation. Um, okay, so we've got some data on the map here. Now, let's pretend that with our planning controls, um, so I can see my zoning here, which is fantastic, but another really important overlay, you know, if I'm looking at maybe, let's not do that part of Sydney, let's do up on the North Shore here, is um, uh, heritage. Now we do have the heritage layer available here. If I type in heritage, again, this is um, some planning layers brought in by the New South Wales government. However, let's just say we couldn't find that in our library and we wanted to add it ourselves. What we can do here over on the right hand side is actually bring our own data into Giraffe. 
The layers that we've already played with so far are all hosted by third parties. In most cases, it's a, it's a government, like New South Wales government here, um, and that's what we call a federated data model. So it means that they own and maintain the data. And in most cases, that's really good because we don't necessarily want to be, and I, when I say us, I, I mean giraffe or yourselves, you don't want to be using out-of-date data. And so the purpose of um, a third party hosting and maintaining that data is that when there is a rezoning or a change to policy, the mapping should be updated to reflect that. And it means you're always using the most accurate and up-to-date information. So um, these web map servers are really fantastic resources. However, there are a few different types of data that can be loaded into Giraffe. The one that we're gonna look at here is the Esri map server or feature server. So this is exactly what this layer here, the heritage layer is, but I'm just gonna show you how to bring in your own um, third-party data if you can't find them in our data library. So when I select that option, it's going to bring up this panel on the right hand side and it's going to say connect to an Esri server and I need the URL of the map service. Um, I have gone to Google and typed in New South Wales LEP layers feature server and if I click on that second link, it takes me to this page here. Um, this is great. It's telling me, you know, I can browse the list. There's a little bit of information about it. There are a few different data sources here over on the left. But what I'm interested in is the ArcGIS REST service. And when I click on that, it's gonna take me to this page here. This may look a bit overwhelming if you're not familiar with this type of data, but all you really need to do is sort of quickly look through this list here to see what layers are available. Sometimes there's only one single layer and that's perfectly fine. Uh, in this instance, we've got six or seven options available. And all you need to do is actually grab this URL. So this address here, is actually going to point Giraffe to that page and show us that information. So when I paste that in here and click Fetch Layers, you can see here that it's showing all of those layers. I'm going to click Heritage because it's the one that we were interested in. I'm just going to head over to the left and turn off my zoning and my imagery just so that we can see it really nicely on the map. Once it's loaded, you will see there is some um, previews over on the right here which is really nice so it sort of shows you what the layers are supposed to look like on the map um, we're looking at heritage it isn't loading just yet but that doesn't mean it won't work let's just triple check there we go so that floor space ratio one is um, responding immediately which is good I'm just going to go back to heritage there we go so it probably just needed a second to load could have been my connection or the government servers but now what we're seeing here is live data that is hosted by the government that we can bring in at any point in time. It's probably important to note that the government aren't the only people that can, people or organization that can publish data in this way. A lot of um, private organizations will have a GIS team who are able to publish data in this way as a map server or a feature server, and you can bring those into Giraffe at any time. So once we've picked the layer that we're interested in, we're gonna click next. Um, and just be, just be aware that you can only bring in one layer at a time in Giraffe. So if we wanted to bring in all six of those options or, or seven, you would need to come back, paste that URL in six or seven times and select the layer that you were interested in. Um, you can rename it if you want to. However, the names that are auto-populated here are the names and the metadata that that agency um, wants you to have. Um, I would then click save layer. What it's going to do is publish that as a layer, which you can see now on the left hand side in my project, I can control it, turn it on and off, and that is connected to that government data source and is available to me. Now, once you have it here, there's a few things you can do with it. Um, if I click on the three dots, um, there's a number of options available to me, and these dots are there for many of the other layers that we've brought in. Um, the first thing I can do is click show legend. And because I've brought this in from an external data source and they've formatted it really nicely, I actually have a legend that tells me what all the different colors on the map represent. Um, I can also click zoom to bounds. Now, because this is a New South Wales wide data set, it's gonna take me to the extent of the whole data set, which in this case is actually not that helpful. But sometimes when you're looking at a smaller data set, you know, it will take you to the extent and that's really helpful. Um, another option we can click on is manage. Now, this may or may not be helpful for every user. 
But what you can see here is that we kind of see those layer details that we formatted when we loaded it. So it gives us the name of the layer. We can change the group name if we want to, and I'll show you where this shows up in a second. Um, and we can change the metadata associated with it. Now, because this is coming from a third party source, I wouldn't recommend that you change any of this data if you um, really don't need to. If you did make changes though, you would simply click save layer and it will make those changes. Um, the other thing we can do is also share our data layers. So if any of you are working within a team or within um, you know, a, a small set of your organization and you're all using Giraffe, you can share that with individuals. So I can invite Rob from my team. I can change, um, choose the level of access that he gets. So if he is an admin, it means that he will have the rights to do the same sorts of editing and sharing that I can do. Otherwise, an editor or a viewer is good. A viewer is probably the most appropriate in most cases when you're sharing data layers with team like this one where they're coming from a third party data source because everyone really just needs to be able to turn them on and off. Once I've done that, I click invite and that means next time Rob jumps into a project within this giraffe team workspace, he will be able to add that as a layer to his project. We can also share it with our whole workspace, which is everyone in our team or um, you know, the workspace. Um, now, I'm just going to close this panel and we're sort of going to make a bit of a sharp turn here because what I've done is create some content on this map and I'm just going to group heritage into this group here. I've put some stuff on the map and I actually really like it. It's kind of giving me a story um, and, you know, I've created some content now that I want to keep. But something that's really important to note here, and this is kind of like very foundational, is that we're currently in a scratch pad state and we're in an unsaved project. So that means that if I click new project or go away and navigate to an existing project that I have, none of this content is going to be saved because we haven't defined it as a project yet. So what I'm going to do is quickly just turn off some of that map content um, we're going to start drawing over here today. And so what I'm going to do is actually draw a boundary. So please just be conscious that when you're in a scratch pad state, anything that you do, even drawing on the map, will not be saved unless you save the project. Um, this scratch pad state is kind of like the equivalent to opening a blank Word document. You can start typing and adding content, but until you click save or save as, that will not be retained by Word. So we're going to draw a boundary um, up in the top right hand corner. There's a red button. And when I activate that, it's going to put a little black dot on my mouse. Um, and what I can do now is nominate a boundary for my project. It can be as accurate or as generic as you like. I will show you how to edit this in a minute. But what the first function that this uh, boundary is doing is defining where our project is saved in the world. It doesn't have to be a rectangle. It can be as crazy a shape as you'd like it to be. Um, you can edit it uh, at any time and we will come back and do that in a second. When I'm happy with the shape, I'm gonna click done. You'll notice then that there's sort of like a dashed um, subtle line on your map and that will show you where the project is saved. But we're not done yet. You have just created a boundary. You now need to save the project. So there's another red button up here saying, please save it. When I click that, it's going to pop up this page here. The first thing you'll notice is that there's a name. This name is really just populated from the central point of your um, the shape that you've drawn. So it's just taking a guess at a name. Um, I'm going to call it a 101 training project. You can make this name as short or as long as you like. Doesn't really matter. Now. Some, you, some of you may or may not have workspace properties. We're probably not going to jump into those today because they're quite advanced. But if you do have properties in your organization, some of them may be mandatory for you to fill in before you can um, save your project. So just work through those if you need to. Um, but if you don't, just click save project. What it's going to do is two things. So it's going to start saving this to the database. But before it does, it's going to ask if we want to share it with anyone in our team. Again, this is where I could invite Rob or maybe Holly from my team and say, hey, uh, I would love you to come along and help me edit this. And when I click invite here, Holly's now going to get an email that says, hey, you've been invited to um, 101 training project. Please click on this link to access it. And she can jump in here anytime as an editor. 
and work on me, work, work on this project with me. Uh, we can also share it with a team or with the whole workspace if we want to, but we're just going to go to projects now. You don't have to share a project with someone if you don't want to. Um, now, what's happened is it has refreshed my browser, but what it's actually done is create, this is a project on the giraffe database. And we know this for two different reasons. The first one is that this no longer says unsaved project. It's called 101 training project. And it means I can sort of jump into a different uh, project and then come back here if I want to um, very easily. So this is now saved. It understands everything that you've already done and it's, it's good to go. The other reason I know that this is saved is because the URL, the address of this project no longer says Scratchpad, it's given us a project ID. So those are the two ways that you can check that you're not working in a Scratchpad state. Okay, so we've got some layers on the map here. Um, I can turn them on and off as I like. Um, and I've created a boundary. So that's really good. Now we can essentially start getting into some of the drawing content. Um, before we do that, I'm just going to show you one more little trick here. I'm going to group these layers and call them map context and click save. Um, and I don't want 3D buildings on. And with the LEP controls, I'm probably going to turn the zoning right down. And I want to keep that heritage there just so that I can think about how we interface with some of the other controls. So for anyone who's not based in this part of the world, um, these red hatches are conservation areas, heritage conservation areas. And that means that all the houses in there, you know, have um, some sort of heritage character element or were built within a certain period or something like that. But um, really what that means is that you cannot really change the density, the character, of the buildings in these areas. And when you're interfacing with them, it means you should probably be conscious of the scale and um, you know, I guess that unique identity of the area. So we wanna be cognizant of that. Now, all of these layers here have some different symbols on them. So you can see that a lot of these ones have a little image on them, which means that they are a raster layer. Um, this is essentially like an image that is being projected onto the map. Some of the other ones though have this little rectangular shape with the four dots and they are vector layers. And we can do some interesting things with vector data, which we'll get to in a little bit. But the layer that we're interested in the most at the moment is the drawing layer. And that's what this little pencil is on the default layer. Every single new project in Giraffe will get this default drawing layer as it suggests by default. And that is because a lot of people come into Giraffe and start drawing immediately on the map and it needs to live somewhere, you know, without someone having to try very hard. So if we start drawing, which I will do now, we're going to grab a, a residential building. And you'll notice that two things are happening here. The first one is that I've drawn a shape and we're going to talk about this shape in a second. Um, but it means that now this layer called default is no longer empty. And in the drawing tray at the bottom here, default giraffe is selected. And that means that it's the active drawing layer. So anything I draw now lives on that layer, which is just really good to know because a lot of people will create new drawing layers, start drawing and not really know where their drawing has gone. And that is uh, controlled with this down here, the drawing, the default drawing layer. What I'm gonna do is make two drawing layers really quickly. We're gonna call the first one option one and you'll see that that comes in on the left hand side over here and it says empty but you'll also notice now that it's bold and it's selected at the bottom here when I go back and select default default now becomes bold and that means that it's the active drawing layer I'm just going to make one more option here called option two and now that is the active drawing layer and it's bold but they're both empty which is totally fine I can group these even if they're empty and say drawing layers or options or something like that. And that's gonna group those two together. Um, I might decide that the default layer, which cannot be deleted. So no matter how hard you try, you can't delete that layer. You can always hide it somewhere if you want to. Um, I'm just gonna keep it in my drawing layer options, but I'm going to probably just ignore it for the most part. 
Now, we have drawn a shape. Um, I'm actually going to delete this and just talk a bit more fundamentally about drawing in a minute, but it's just really important to understand that right now I've got option two as the default layer, so you can, or sorry, as the active layer, so you can see that's selected. So that means as soon as I start drawing on the map, this now lives on option two and that's how I control it. So just be really conscious when you're drawing about what your active layer is. You can change the active layer by really simply selecting it and then that will make it bold and you'll see that that becomes the active layer. Okay, so drawing. Um, before we start drawing our option one, what I'm gonna do is actually very quickly edit my project boundary. So we drew this kind of funny shape and now that I'm looking at my map, I've decided um, I'm gonna turn on the parcel controls and I'm gonna look a little bit more accurately at where I'm drawing. So uh, we're gonna talk through all of these drawing things in a second, but in the third or the last option, rather the three dots, we can edit the project boundary. Now, when you draw any shape in giraffe, um, it will highlight the anchor points. So they are sort of the gray and red circles that are visible at any anchor or you know, junction on the shape that you've drawn. And you can push and pull these anytime you like. So I can grab these and um, drop them in the right locations. And this same principle applies to like buildings that you draw, for example. So you can move those anchor points at any time like this. And what you can also do is click on them just once and it will actually delete them as well. So instead of dragging them, you might wanna remove one and you do that very simply by clicking on it. You can also add new anchor points by clicking on that midpoint. So there's sort of like an opaque, uh, like a transparent circle in the center. And if you click that, it will create a new point. So you can add or remove them as you like very easily. So I've decided that this is the area that I'm going to concentrate on. This It's um, looking over what's actually currently a bus depot, but we're going to make it a park. So I'm going to click done. And that will now save that boundary. There's nothing you need to do. It's just going to remember that. Okay, so now the real drawing. So we've got option one empty um, as the active drawing layer. So what I'm going to do is come back down to our drawing tray here and pick the draw building features. So here are some of the default giraffe options for different types of um, usages that you can draw with. But we're not going to pick one of these. I'm going to show you a little bit more fundamentally how you create your own ones in here instead of using these predefined ones. So if we click on the, um, the, three, uh, the three buttons again that give us some general drawing options, um, you'll see at the top of that list there is polygons and rectangles. Now I'm going to pick polygon, but I could also just type P on my keyboard as a shortcut. Now the reason I picked polygon is because it means that I can draw a more specific shape. If I start with rectangle, I can only get stuck drawing a rectangle with right angles. I can always edit that shape afterwards, but it means that I'm always gonna start with a rectangle, which may be appropriate in some instances. So use whatever is um, you know, more helpful for your use case. Okay, this is kind of the most um, important thing for you to understand in giraffe. So we've just drawn a shape and it doesn't really matter what that shape is, but at the moment, this is just a shape. It's actually called a polygon because it's a closed, um, a closed shape. And we know it's closed because it's got this gray fill in the middle. And this polygon understands its total area and it understands the length of every um, side that it has. It doesn't matter how many sides it has, but it understands the length of all of them. Now, what giraffe does is essentially takes this really dumb flat shape and basically starts assigning some attributes to it based on your input. So we have a concept called usages over on the top right hand side here. There's, you can see some apps and if we click on the first one with the sliders that's called usages, it's going to open up this window here. And now any planners on the call will understand that, you know, we have all these kinds of urban typologies or urban usages and what we've done here is give you some default ones to start with. Now you can edit these at any time or make your own ones. And I will show you how to edit them and create your own. But these are just starting points for you to start sort of imagining and, um, you know, like measuring your design essentially. 
So we're going to pick residential because this is going to be a residential building here. Now, again, we populate this with a whole bunch of assumptions for you as a starting point, but you can change them at any time. We've got an efficiency rate, um, which if you're based in New South Wales is helping you calculate your um, GFA, uh, your gross floor area. It's called different things in different states, but you can change this number at any time. Um, so I want to change it from 80 to 85. We've got a floor to floor height, which just tells us how high each story of the building is. We've got zero fixed parking bays, but this is a fixed number that doesn't change. So if we add 10, it's going to account for 10 parking bays um, if we want it to. This bit here is um, an important one. One of the jobs that I used to do all the time as a strategic planner is create land use plans that needed to understand how many dwellings and how many people would be living in that particular you know, development or master plan. Um, so what we've done is given you the option to have different size uh, you know, apartments within a residential building. Now, this residential typology could be used for a single story, you know, uh, detached dwelling or an apartment building. And it's kind of up to you to curate what you want. I'm gonna make this an apartment building today because it's slightly more complex. But if you had a single or like a two bedroom house, you would really simply delete your three bed, one bed and two bed typologies. You would need to make sure that the size of the studio apartment or the one bed was appropriate for what you had drawn. But here I'm pretty happy with the existing um, mix of stuff. This also tells us the price of square meter per dwelling, the number of cars, car parks that need to be attributed to it and the number of people. This slider underneath here then gives us a breakdown of the number of those apartments. Now, initially studio was at zero and I'm gonna keep it that way. It means I don't have to delete this assumption, but it won't count any studios because I have said zero percentage of this building should be studio apartments. The rest though, you can change the mix. So depending on the location of your project, it may be not appropriate to have 50% one bedders, you might have a lot of a big family market and you want more three bedroom apartments and so on. So you, you designate this mix as you like. Um, you can also change the colors and a few things like that. There are some costs and whatnot. We're gonna come back to some of that later, but I'm gonna click save changes. Now I showed you this residential, all these assumptions, because now that we've drawn this kind of dumb flat shape, what I'm gonna do is click on it. And when you select a drawing or a geometry in Giraffe, it's gonna show you the properties tab for that piece of geometry that you've drawn. Now, the first thing I wanna do is give it a usage. And I'm gonna scroll down and find residential that we just played with. And when it does that, it immediately starts applying all of those assumptions that we just looked at and defined to our dumb flat shape. Now, before we talk about the right hand side, you can see a few things have happened. When we picked residential, it immediately added two new properties here called setback and levels. And I hope I'll just reiterate just so that we're super clear. Um, remember that option one was the active layer when we started drawing. So this lives on option one as the layer, but you can always change it. So when I mentioned that some people accidentally draw on default, all you need to do is select your layer and move it to a different um, layer if, if, you, if required, if you don't want it to live on that default one. Now, something that's happened is that we make some pretty general assumptions about the height of different buildings based on the typology. So 10 for an apartment, like for a residential building is kind of our default, but you absolutely don't need to do that. We can control this and say, I actually only want it to be six levels tall. And all it's doing is taking that really dumb shape the floor to floor height assumption that we set here and projecting it up six times and then going to count six levels of floor space. So what's happening over on the right hand side here is that it is counting that gross floor area and we can see it as gross building area instead if we want or net sellable area. Um, and it's just going to take those assumptions that you have here and apply them to that dumb shape. So a lot of people get a little bit caught up sometimes on um, you know, what the transformation that's happening is. Just, just, I think if you can really grasp that you're drawing a shape and then applying some different assumptions to it, that's a really, you know, core thing. And once you've got that, you'll, you'll get a lot more of giraffe, which is really great. Now, 
we don't have to stop here. I can do a few things. I can come um, and click P for polygon again on my um, keyboard. And I can actually draw, you know, another shape here and make it as small, large, wacky, interesting as I want. Now I've drawn another rectangle here, but I haven't given it any properties or assigned it any values yet. So it's still blank. So what I'm gonna do is also give this a residential usage. And you'll see then that it immediately pops up on top of my building so we can stack. Okay, I'm gonna put this down to four. Now you'll notice that when I did that, it kind of went, oh, okay, maybe I'm smaller and I'm not as big as this one. Uh, and that's not necessarily right. So we give you a command called stack order to override that. So um, you can change this at any point in time. And every single geometry should have its own stack order. So the one on the bottom is now one. We can make it zero if we want to. And then the one on top has a stack order of two. But even if I put it down to one, zero is still lower, obviously. Um, so you can start stacking as many different things as you like on top of each other. So you can have lots of different elements to your building. What you can also do instead of drawing from scratch is select a layer and actually copy and paste it. Uh, uh, sorry, a drawing, I mean, and copy and paste it. I'm just going to literally hit Command C on my Apple keyboard, but, you know, Control C, Control V. And when I paste, it will always paste it in place. So there's actually two of these shapes stacked on top of each other now, and you can see them highlighted. I'm going to take my bottom one, and I'm actually going to choose to change this from residential to maybe commercial. Now, it changed the stack order, but that's okay. We can control that very easily. You can go into the negative numbers as long as you're keeping track of how those numbers are, you know, um, interacting with each other. You can kind of do whatever you like, um, but stack order will control that. I then want to drop this down to one level, and you can see then that now I've got one nice level of commercial on my podium. I um, want to drop this down pretty significantly, maybe to three stories. So then I have a nice four story podium. Now, just because we copied and pasted those options on top of each other, um, doesn't mean that they have to stay like that. So I'm going to click on, uh, we can do this in the 3D view or we can do it in 2D view. And where you click on something that intersects with two different geometries, you just need to select the one. So we want the commercial option. And what I can do is actually edit this shape here to make it, you know, just slightly different. So just because you copy and paste something as a starting point doesn't mean it has to stay like that. You've got full flexibility. So here we've got a nice little commercial residential podium and then some more residential on top. Um, and let's just say I'm quite happy with this drawing. Um, what we're doing as we're drawing and editing these shapes is calculating areas. Um, there's a pretty big deep dive on this stuff. So if you're interested in any more detail about what is actually being calculated here, um, there's plenty of videos or you can book in um, a session with us. Um, but I just wanna show you two or three more quick drawing things. We've got about 10 minutes left. So I'm just gonna take you through the other drawing options here. So we've worked with polygon and then rectangle will do exactly the same thing as I said, it will give you the ability to draw a rectangle and then assign a usage and then delete that one. Um, and we sort of looked at this very um, quickly, but I will just iterate here. What you can do in this list is predefine the usage that you want to work with. So I want to draw a little community building over on the corner here, overlooking this park. Um, and so you can see that I was given the same sort of control of drawing the shape, but it's actually pre-populated the usage um, into that shape as I've drawn. So it's kind of like a shortcut if you want to just start immediately with your typology, but that's not always the way some of our users want to work. So we've got a little community building here. I'm going to give it two levels. Um, we then have uh, the next tool is landscape. So the next little section of um, things that you can draw. Now we want to use landscape simple, um, which really is kind of like an undefined green space. So um, when you draw this again, it will be a rectangle, but we can edit this shape to suit our needs. So I've drawn a rectangle uh, at the midpoint of every line. You'll see there's two arrows. If you just pull them, it will pull 
that whole line um, with you uh, to the extent that you like. I'm going to create another midpoint here and I'll show you one more thing that you can do with this pull. So we can pull it to, you know, be wherever we like. Um, if I'm just going to click control Z and undo that. But what I can actually do is as I'm pulling, I can type. So you see that large box that's sort of halfway through the line that says 2.2. And as I move, it dynamically changes the number. I can actually type 10 meters and it will offset 10 meters. So if you're working from a property boundary and you want to set inwards or outwards, you can very simply um, type the number, pull in the direction you want. So you don't have to click negative or anything like that. And it will snap very simply to that location. Um, I'm just going to try and align this shape here roughly with this outline. So what I'm going to do is create, you know, some different anchor points and then I'm going to delete this one and then it should really nicely hug that boundary. Um, and that's it. So now we've got a park, which is really nice. Now this park is not within our boundary and that's totally fine because it's not going to count that as gross floor area. However, it will start contributing to our open space count. So just, you know, um, be cautious and set up your project appropriately for that kind of use case. Now, when we talked about drawing layers, I made an option one and an option two. What I'm actually gonna do is grab this, uh, this landscape and put it on default because if I'm turning option one off, I don't want the landscape to turn off because this is gonna be a constant in our project. What I'm going to do now, though, is actually turn off option one and make option two visible um, or the active layer. And I am going to draw again. And this time we're just going to do a community building. So let's say that the second option is to put some really great community facilities. I'm going to copy that shape and paste it. And option two is our default you know, active layer. Sorry. So you can see now that I've got two shapes on top of each other. We're just going to take that second one, slightly edit it, and maybe pop it up a few stories. What I can also do here is um, add some more open space. So we're going to go back to this tool here and go landscape again. Now, something that I haven't mentioned yet, which is a drawing shortcut, is snap. And this is really helpful when you're working on different types of operations. If I click S, it's going to immediately try and snap to an existing anchor point. So if I hit snap there, oh, S, got to hold it down, S for snap. And, um, oh, sorry, you got to hit P for polygon. I want to draw and then S for snap. And it's going to snap to any vector um, anchor point that I can find. So there it's grabbed some corners. I'm just going to edit it, pull it here and give this a landscape usage. And so in this option, I actually want to have extra park, which we can see here, which is what I'm after. So I've then got option one and option two. They're both on separate layers. And you'll notice that when I turn them on and off, so at the moment, neither of them are visible. We're not calculating any anything except this um, this large park. And if I was to turn the park off, then it's going to count nothing. So something really important to grasp in Giraffe is that whatever is visible on the map will be counted. So if you're looking between different options, always make sure you have the appropriate option turned off. Um, you can play with the visibility by changing the transparency. So we can sort of, you know, play with that if we like. Now, one more thing that I want to show you is um, the option that you have with your usages is to create your own one. So let's just say that um, this building here was actually not going to be uh, a community building. I wanted to make it maybe a childcare. So what I need to do, first of all, because it doesn't exist, I need to make that usage. And the way that you do that is to pick the usage that you know exists that is closest to the new one that you want. So we're going to go and start with community. And what we're actually going to do is clone it. So this button here, when I clone that, it asks me for a new name and I'm going to call this childcare. And what it's done is essentially copied that community one like verbatim. It's exactly the same. But now I can go through and edit it. So I might change the efficiency rate, for example. I can change the color of it. So we might make this like a, a pinky magenta sort of color we can give it a different line color and when I save that 
two things have happened. It's now available in the list of options up there. It's also available in the list of options down here. So what I can do is select my building here, this two level community building and actually change it to childcare. So suddenly we're counting some new different type of floor space that community has changed to um, childcare. And um, we can see that on the map there with the color represented. So it's really easy for you to create or manage all your usages. Um, if, for example, we made childcare but decided actually that was not appropriate, we could change it back to community over here and then really simply select childcare and delete that usage if we didn't want it. So you can manage that really easily yourself. And when you create new usages, they are saved to this project. So that childcare usage doesn't exist in any other project that I have, only in this 101 training project. Okay, so we've got two options, uh, which is really nice. Um, the last sort of uh, really quick things that I wanna show you are that you can drop a tree in. So we can easily drop a tree on this site here um, and populate them if that's what we want. Something that we can also do um, is draw a road. And this is kind of the last little piece of drawing that we're going, or the second last piece of drawing that we're gonna talk about in the last 60 seconds of today. Um, there are some way more complicated drawing that you can do with our flow tool, but that is definitely a little bit more advanced and we have plenty of sessions and training on this stuff if it's of interest, but we're just gonna quickly draw a road. So let's just say um, this existing Anne Street, this tool gives us a line and to finish a line, you just want to double click. And as you draw that, you'll see that the road drops in. Again, we just give you some default starting points, but a six meter road is um, not very wide. So we might make this a 12 meter road with footpaths of three meters on either side. Um, and we then have a nice road. We can edit those points at any time to change the shape or direction of the road. And something really nice is that I'm just going to click L for line on the keyboard and draw another road that intersects directly with this one. So we're going to give it the road usage. When you join roads, um, it doesn't even matter how wide they are, but it will form a nice little network. So we get a junction there, which is graphically quite pleasing. Um, so now we've got on option two, we have a community building with some trees and a road. And then option one has this residential building, a commercial ground floor and a childcare. So we've brought in some layers on the map. We've drawn some different options and we're calculating some information over here on the right. The last thing that I might wanna do is just really quickly add um, an annotation. So let's just say in this example, so we're looking at option one here. I'm gonna make sure option one is my active layer. And we're gonna to go to this last drawing tool, which is an annotation. And up the top here, we've got a few different options. We can draw a text or icon marker. So I'm gonna go with text. I'm gonna drop the point where I want this new marker to be. And it's gonna bring up this panel on the left here. Now there's lots of different options, but I want this one here, which is the text within, um, in this case, it's a shape, the circle, but I actually want a rectangle. And here is where we put the text. I'm actually gonna put a B I'm going to do like a bus stop, for example, and that will then populate it like this. And now I can begin formatting it. So if I want my background color to be black, for example, but I want my text color to be white, uh, I actually don't want a border. The border is always going to be the same color as your text. So if you're not interested in one, simply click X and it will go away. If you do want one, you can uh, control the width of it just here and then stick is putting it up high on a little stick like that. Oh, sorry, zoom out. Um, that stick height will dictate how you know high it is. And if you wanna play with the size of it or the scale, you can um, really simply control it like this. So you can make some interesting little icons um, or annotations. I'll just show you one more really quick one. We'll do the same again, a text icon, and we're gonna make a secondary bus stop here. In New South Wales here, um, we have a few pretty um, well-defined ways of styling like bus and train and metro station things. 
Um, we're going to make the background colour here for a bus stop, for a bus in New South Wales is like a nice kind of blue like that. And the text colour is usually white. The border might be uh, slightly smaller. And this is probably not quite the right blue. That's probably a little better. Uh, we can then put it on a stick and we've now got a bus. Um, so it's really easy to make these annotations that you can then drop on your map um, and remember that they will also live on the option that you create. So that is um, the session for today. Um, I am not sure. Hello, everyone who joined. Um, as this was a 101, we've gone through some of the really basic functionality. So I would definitely encourage all of you to go ahead and look at our um, YouTube channel if you wanted to deep dive into some other kinds of functionality um, and you can always schedule some training with Holly or myself um, but happy to take one or two questions but we are over time apologies we were a few minutes late starting waiting for people to join but any any quick questions yeah I, I had a question for you can you hear me yep okay so um Three questions. First one, how could I include um, drone image of a of a site? So say it's contoured, it's sloping down, there's a three meter rise from one end to the other. I take a picture and I want to import the contours and I want to import, build a building on top. How would I do that? Sure. Okay. So there's a few things you need to do. Um, what sort of format is your elevation information and your, um, your aerial imagery? A are you looking at like a 3D scene server and lidar data or have you just got a screenshot that you want to upload i've got a screenshot that i want to upload sure okay let me share my screen again um so over in the left hand side on data layers um, if we click this button again we can create our own image vector layer so if we do this uh, what I might do is just quickly type in aerial image and that's not really what we want. Um, let's just pick something like this and we'll save this image on our desktop and we'll come back here and we'll just need to reload this so that it knows it's on my desktop. We can go here to image, browse, find that from our desktop. Oh, that's not a JPEG. <laughs> um, go away. Um, how do I get that to move up the top? Um, let's do this. We'll call master plan and we'll go to images and we'll grab something like this one. And that should be an image, I think. Yeah, a JPEG. Okay. So we'll come back here, browse for that JPEG um, and open it. And what it's going to do, and you could imagine if this was your LiDAR image, so an aerial image or actual master plan that had a cadaster as a reference, you can now increase the size, you can rotate, we can remove the transparency, and you can essentially map that master plan to your site and use it either as a reference file, or I guess in your case, Greg, you're probably looking to use it as information to plan on top of. So let's say that this kind of aligns quite nicely around our park here for some reason. So let's say we're using this as a, a base reference. Once we've got it in the correct location, we click next, we can change the naming conventions as we saw earlier. And next, um, save layer. And it's actually gonna drop into our layer menu over on the left-hand side here in a second as our master plan report layer. And so if this had your contours or other things on it, we could now start you know, drawing or tracing on top of these um, shapes or your contours um, and use them as a reference, like a visual reference point. So it's a really nice way of um, sort of getting somewhere very quickly. Does that roughly answer your question? Yeah. I know I didn't use an image with a um, with contours on it, but you can see how that becomes a reference that you can use really easily. That was awesome. What about the, well? The last question is: What about importing 
a, a detail and contour survey for say that park there on the left to get some mm, action? Good question. So this is definitely not 101 conversation, but that's not a problem. Um, a CAD file is usually, like a survey is usually vector data. So it's going to come in um, using this category. So the et cetera in this case is actually CAD or a DWG, a DXF. Now, it really actually just depends on how good that your surveyor, your engineer or your architect was, because I think some people on this call will know that CAD files can be really messy, really large, lots of different types of data in them. Um, if you have a CAD file that has sort of like 50 layers, 35 of them are hidden, there's another, you know, 15 that are visible. Um, it's going to be hard to bring it into giraffe because giraffe will not maintain the layer. So it's just going to give you a whole bunch of layer lines and points and polygons that drop on the map. If your polygons are not closed proper poly lines, then they won't come in as closed shapes. So if you have building footprints included in the survey, it can kind of be a mess. So there is a little bit of cleaning that you need to do beforehand to bring it in properly. It also will need to be accurately geolocated. Um, you'll probably need to know the projection of the file before you bring it in. Most giraffe projects by default use a web Mercator projection and you can always check that by going into the top menu, go to project settings here and you'll see in system down the bottom, uh, sorry, uh, other, or, yeah, other, you can add a project CRS. So here, this is the um, existing uh, like web Mercator global projection that we use for all our projects. You can change this to a custom like projection, you know, like a GDA 94, the specific zone for your part of the country. Um, you'll just need to talk to us about importing the correct string of text here to represent that, but that's not hard to do. We do that all the time. Um, and only then will your projected survey drop in at the right point. So there is a little bit of the normal kind of GIS work that you need to do to make sure it works well. So Greg could be best to get in touch and we can have a one-on-one -on -one session with that stuff. But um, yeah, CAD files can be quite troublesome because there's a lot of different ways that people set those files up. So it really just depends on the outcome that you're looking for. But the high level notes are they need to be projected correctly. Um, if at all, lot, many, many people just start drawing at zero in CAD, which will not come into giraffe in the way that you want it to. Um, and it also needs to have really clean, um, hygienic, you know, lines and um, layer sistering, uh, systems. So best to get in touch if you're having trouble, but you can definitely try um, using that vector import. So you just drop the DXF or the DWG straight in here and it should um, it should drop onto the right location if it's properly projected. Sure. Um, I actually have another session, but I can see um, Brandon and Matt, you're both on the call. Any really quick questions for you guys? Otherwise, happy for you to email me um, and we can do follow-up sessions if needed. And I'll take silence as a no if you're too far away from your um, from your microphones. But there is also stuff on the chat. I oh, just all thanks. Awesome, Brandon. Feel free to email me. Um, my email is in the chat if you like, and um, we can get a session set up. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Lucy. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank well, you, thanks, Lucy. everyone, and sorry about the extra time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lucy. Bye. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.